Welcome to this event entitled Mediation and Litigation, Best Friends or Just Casual Acquaintances. Before we get started, as usual, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Mediate Guru. Mediate Guru is a social initiative led by members across the globe. We have the aim of creating a bridge between the general public and litigation, and we're doing this by creating a social awareness campaign showcasing mediation as the future. We've successfully conducted various international webinars so far on alternative dispute resolution and have a reach in more than 60 countries across the world. And we are an international family growing each day, thriving to bring you access to the best lecture series so that you can add value to your legal studies and your legal career. Now I'm going to introduce our esteemed guest for today's session, who is Andrew Miller. Andrew is a QC and he is the current UK Civil and Commercial Mediator of the Year. Andrew has 30 years of experience dealing with and resolving commercial disputes domestically and internationally. He is a mediator and arbitrator in a wide range of commercial sectors, including construction, energy, property damage, insurance and professional negligence. As for mediation, Andrew is accredited by both the Centre for Effective Dispute Resolution and the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. He has experience of over 150 mediations and has mediated disputes in the UK, France, Spain, Germany, Lithuania, Turkey, Canada and the USA. And finally, Andrew also teaches the RICS Evaluative Mediation Accreditation course and has judged various mediation competitions in India. Andrew regularly speaks about mediation and has spoken in the UK, Dubai, Singapore, India, Cambodia, and the Philippines. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the session on to Andrew so that we can benefit from his experience. Um, over to you, Andrew, thank you. Thank you very much I indeed uh, for such a great um, uh, a great introduction and it's a pleasure to be here uh, again once again looking through the camera lens rather than seeing anyone and I do hope uh, although this remote world of ours will no doubt continue I do hope we're going to be meeting each other face to face uh, in the not too distant future. Um, I hope and can you tell me that you can hear me because I just got flashed up something telling me there was an issue with my Wi-Fi signal. Um, so um, am I coming through loud and clear? Anyone? We can hear you, Andrew. <laughs> Perfect. OK, the silence was a bit was deafening, uh, absolutely deafening. Right, so let, let me tell you that you, you've had the introduction. Uh, I mean, the short introduction to me is uh, I'm a barrister. I've been a lawyer for 30 years, and I was in full-time practice as a barrister, a commercial barrister in QC for over 25 years, using mediation a lot as a lawyer. Uh, and um, so myself appearing as a mediation advocate on a, a very regular basis and always being a big, big fan of, of mediation. Um, I was such a supporter, um, but I also had uh, certain feelings or you could say criticisms uh, of the, the process and indeed of, of some mediators. Um, and I thought there came a time where I, I would want to put my money where my mouth was and I decided to um, jump uh, initially quite slowly, um, but from being in regular practice um, to being what I am now, it is a full-time mediator. And I don't practice as a lawyer anymore. Uh, I sit as an arbitrator, but I don't practice um, as a lawyer. A and there were several reasons why I, I chose to do it. Um, but one of them was that um, whenever and my life was doing trials, whether it be domestic or in arbitration or internationally, um, I, I would on occasion, of course, win some of those um, disputes. And sometimes when that happened, individuals would come, clients, and would thank you, but it didn't always happen. But the one thing that was absolutely guaranteed is that in the 25 plus years uh, of my being a um, an advocate, uh, and fighting, fighting people's corners, was that no one came to me at the end of it and said, 
thank you, Andrew, for keeping us in this dispute. You've really, really made our last one, two, three, five years. Uh, and what I came to see, and I, I, if I'm honest, I saw it throughout my career, was just firstly how difficult dispute was, uh, how um, expensive it, it was, uh, what the stress on the individuals in, involved um, is at every single stage, and to a large extent, how necessary so many of the disputes are. Um, disputes arise, but when I say unnecessary, unnecessary for staying in, in dispute so long. Uh, and mediation offers a way out. So that brings me to the title because I, I, I was, I, I still am by title, a lawyer. And the mediations that I do are commercial. They very much reflect the practice that I had at the bar. So I specialized in construction, insurance, property damage, commercial, and I see those mediations. The, the majority of my mediations, there's always some exceptions, but the vast majority are commercial mediations. And within that, the majority of those are um, disputes that are already in the litigation arena. They may be at an early stage of it, um, they may be halfway through, they may even be a few weeks from trial, but they're very much in the litigation arena. And I am not unique, uh, and I'm in the majority in terms of the uh, commercial mediators, certainly practicing in the UK and, and practicing uh, internationally. The majority of the work we see is, uh, is, in, is at some stage of litigation or arbitration process, but I'll call it for the purposes of this litigation process, uh, and involves lawyers. And that's something um, that certainly when I had my training as a mediator, and, and I think even you know, training um, today, it's not concentrated on. Uh, and for me, as I have, uh, as I've grown, or at least I hope I've grown as a mediator, um, I've realized that my best chance of being a, a decent mediator and helping the parties is at all times being aware of this relationship between mediation and litigation. Yeah. It's not me advocating the relationship, it's me recognizing that the relationship um, exists uh, and a good mediator will take, uh, will take that on board. Um, when they they are mediating. So that's what this talk is about. It's not how to mediate. Um, so hopefully those of you who are, are watching haven't come to hear that, but it's about that. And the reason I give this talk, and I give this talk, um, uh, I've, I've given this talk or similar talks to, uh, all over the UK and around the world, and to various different people. I, I've given it to, to mediators, um, very much to lawyers, and where it's possible, um, where there are, are uh, certain groups to users of mediation, so to construction organizations, maybe insurers, um, et cetera, because I think it's very important to have, have some un understanding uh, of what's going on in the background and how this is all working at the moment. So let me start the, the slideshow. Uh, and, uh, it's appearing to me, so I'm, I'm going to take it as read that it's a, a appearing um, to you. Um, let me, here we go. Okay, so when I, most of my talks obviously predated the COVID pandemic. And when I would be standing in front of an audience, I uh, would always start with this slide to see the reaction. Well, I can't see you, so I, I'm going to guess your reaction because it was almost always the same. And the reaction in the room generally was silence. Uh, people didn't laugh. And I found this strange because when I first found this, uh, this cartoon, I, I thought it was pretty funny. And then I, a while after I'd been using it, um, I was listening to something, I can't remember if it was uh, online or on TV, I, I think it was on a radio show, and they were talking about lawyers, and they were talking in um, the usual disparaging way, 
and they moved on to talk about uh, jokes about lawyers, legal jokes. And someone made a, a, a statement and they said the thing about legal jokes is that lawyers don't find them, them uh, funny and non-lawyers don't think they're jokes. And that just about encapsulated it for me. Um, because if you look at this very simplistic cartoon, the dad is saying to the kids, children, let's settle this like adults. And the kids are saying, oh, that means litigation. And the lawyer doesn't find it funny because that's not a joke. That's the answer where there's a dispute, litigation. Uh, and the non-lawyer doesn't think it's a joke because he knows that every he or she knows that everything goes to litigation. And so for me, that's when I would explain this, I'd then get a chuckle in the audience. And for me, why this cartoon, why I still use the cartoon, whether I get a, a response or not, is because those um, six words that the father say contains one that's all important. And it's the word settle. And for me, that is what mediation is about. It is about settling the dispute. You can attend as many webinars and you will hear and you can read many books and you will hear many people explaining the different um, facets of mediation and why mediation is, is necessary and how you mediate. But for me, there's one thing that every person in a mediation needs to have in their mind. And that is that this is a process that I, I am involved with, whether I am the, the, the party, the, the, the lawyer or the mediator to achieve a settlement. That doesn't mean that a settlement will be achieved. Not every mediation will, but that's the goal. That's the, 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 the goal of mediation. And I'll come back to it because I think that it's the, the overriding thing. So how am I going to introduce, how am I going to talk about this relationship between mediation and litigation? Well, let's start on, on the easy stuff, because when you start learning about mediation, and even when you do a mediation accreditation course, you're told about the advantages of mediation. And, and I'm sure all of those listening will have heard these before. Uh, affordability, efficiency, accessibility, flexibility, effectiveness. And all those are, are absolutely, um, absolutely true. Um, and some of these have become even stronger as we've moved into to remote mediation. So it, it's with all that, with it being cheaper, with it being more efficient, more accessible and more flexible and more effective, um, I, I then pose a question. Um, excuse the typo, but I've chosen uh, India because I've been speaking a lot in India at the moment, but it applies wherever you are sitting um, in, in the world at the moment. Um, and it's a question, you know, um, mediation in, in India and litigation and, and arbitration. Now, so the questions I posed is, uh, and I'd like you, wherever you are in the world, to look at them and think, which one do, does your um, nation fall into? Which one does your legal services, your legal procedures fall into? Is it utilized? Is it enforced? Is it encouraged? Is it talked about? Is it disliked, avoided, feared, or not, un not understood? And that's important because it gives you the basis for understanding what's going on. So if I take the UK, and of course that's my, my best example, that's where I mediate um, on the, the, a regular basis, it's certainly utilized, it's not enforced, it's encouraged by obviously by mediation practitioners and by mediation associations um, and by the judiciary, but it's not encouraged at the moment by government. Whereas if I was to look at Singapore, um, I see very much it, it is in, encouraged there. So it's not in, encouraged by perhaps um, the powers that be that m one might like. It's certainly talked about a lot, especially in COVID times, um, the amount of mediation webinars or mediation associated webinars there are uh, is quite incredible. Yeah? Is it disliked? 
Um, by some, uh, it, certainly in the UK, there are, are many lawyers who still do not like it. There are many um, people who've used mediation who may not have, have liked it. And certainly in the UK, it's avoided by some. Uh, it's even avoided by some practitioners, even if it's being encouraged um, uh, by, uh, by the, the jury, judiciary. Uh, and is it feared? Well, I think it is by some. I, I can't say it's greatly feared, but I, I think that the process can be um, feared by, by people. But what certainly in UK, and I think in many parts of the world, um, it's not, it's certainly not understood by a lot of people. If you uh, ask people about a what's a court case, most people in the UK will be able to describe it to you, um, obviously because they've seen it on television, etc. Uh, if you ask someone, can you tell me what a mediation is? Uh, if you just walk down the street, I'm not sure how many people would be able to, to tell you um, about that. So, I, I pose the question uh, as why is mediation not more widespread and widely used um, it, it, in India and worldwide? And um, if you attend mediation webinars, you, you'd think it is um, yeah, very well attended everywhere, very well used everywhere. Um, but that really isn't the case. It, it is certainly um, underutilized to, um, to a great extent. So let me try and give you some answers. And I, these are my personal views, um, uh, very much from uh, that I've garnished from my practice um, as, uh, as a mediator. Um, so the first is, I, I always like to talk about the ADR basket. Um, and this is where I actually think some of the issues um, come about. You know? And the first is, is that um, both arbitration and mediation were placed in the ADR bar in the uh, ADR basket. You know? But there's a huge difference between them. You know? uh, arbitration, as I'm sure all of you know, is litigation by another name. It's private litigation. You know? And the outcome of that is the same as litigation in the courts. It's an outcome by a, an arbitrator or arbitrators. Yeah. And you'll see the phrase I've used there, what well, I call it, it's a determinator. So it's a determination process, it's, it's no different. Mediation, of course, is outcome by resolution, by self-determination. Yeah. And therefore, I, I pose the question as to whether um, it, it's actually right that they're both being referred to as being alternative dispute resolutions. And so the relationship um, between litigation and mediation, I think you can only really call something a proper alternative if it really is an alternative if it really is a true alternative uh, to, um, to what it's seeking to be, i.e. litigation or arbitration. But if in fact it is simply an, an, an adjunct, an add-on to the process, it begs the question as to what exactly is it. And where you have, as you do, certainly in the UK and, and in probably in most jurisdictions, you have the fact that mediation as I said, in my case, in my practice, I'm seeing mediations that are, are part of, of the litigation process or, or arbitration process. What that means is you have a blurring of these very, very different and distinct lines yeah. and, and a blurring of the boundaries between determination by another, a, a judge or by arbitrators and the blurring of that with the principle of self-determination, which mediation is. And so what the result of that is, is that mediation um, becomes and has become more interest-based, uh, more adversarial and more positional. And those words, interest-based, positional, adversarial, 
are the very words that you associate with litigation and arbitration, but are not necessarily or perhaps should not be associated uh, with mediation. And that's why in some jurisdictions, they, they even have, uh, they refer to mediation as being legal mediation. It, it's mediation as part of the process. Uh, and I, I heard that term, um, that term used um, uh, fairly regularly. So if we look at the two and pose the question, is arbitration truly an ADR? Um, the answer is an absolute yes. Um, in most cases, the method of determination of a dispute has been predetermined. The parties, when they have entered into a contract, have made a decision that if there is going to be a dispute, if we if we end up in dispute, that dispute will be dealt with by way of our arbitration, as opposed to going to court. So they've made um, quite clearly a, a a decision, an alternative decision as to how it's going to be. Contrast that with with mediation, uh, and. Uh, for me, my view is it can only be properly described as a true alternative to either litigation or, 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 or arbitration if it's not this addition, this adjunct to the process. Yeah. Um, and so I, I've gone back to, to this slide because it's the blurring. It's not the parties having decided we're going to do uh, an alternative. Um, it, it's It's simply... The, the parties choosing to mediate as part of the process. So let me just concentrate because obviously I'm based in, in the UK uh, and what's been happening here and you can contrast it where you are uh, around the world. Yeah. And, and in the UK, mediation has been driven by the judiciary, by procedural rules, by EU directives, um, as they, they were, obviously we're no longer um, bound by, by those anymore. But in the UK, we don't have, uh, and I personally am pleased that we don't have commercial uh, litigation. Um, it's driven by commercial demands. So I use the example of in insurers there. Insurers are quite wedded to settling their cases rather than take them to trial if they can, uh, and so they will do it m more more often than than not. So they are they bought into the process, and that has meant that those who are dealing with their process, dealing with um, the the disputes, the the litigation or, or the arbitration, are geared towards doing it. the The timing of the mediation is, is remains something difficult in, in the mediations in many. Not all, but in many insurance cases, tend to be quite late uh, in the day. Yeah. But as like I said, there's no compulsory mediation um, in, in the UK. There was in 2008, a, uh, so you know, a good time ago, um, an EU directive to the effect um, that um, it should be uh, there should be compulsory mediation, um, and it was adopted by the UK, but not implemented and. and uh, it, it's certainly not going to be uh, now. So what it comes down to in in um, the UK has been a carrot and, and stick approach. Uh, and I say that because initially, when the court started and when the procedural rules started to change, what they um, effectively did was offer encouragement um, to parties to mediate. And the carrot turned a bit to a stick because... Um, there are now penalties and the penalties are used more freely if you don't mediate uh, and you're a successful party, you may find that you are um, paying higher costs or losing uh, losing your own costs uh, as, a, as a result. So that's litigation. But what's really important in all this is, is, is as you know, is mediation is about people. And so if I, I gave this the title mediation and litigation, but really what we're also talking about are the, the lawyers. And so for me, a really crucial thing when you're when you're mediating is understanding the relationship between between lawyers and, and mediation. And I could say between lawyers and, and the mediator. 
But in terms of lawyers and, and mediation, what I have found in all my mediations is if I'm talking about the relationship and, and saying, is it a good relationship or, or is it a bad relationship or a mediocre relationship? It depends on, on so many things. And I've listed a few. It's certainly not all of them. It depends on the type of case, uh, the workload of, of the lawyer, um, what I call respect for the mediation process. Yeah, not everyone believes in the mediation process. We can't force it on everyone. <laughs> I'm an advocate for, for mediation uh, and I have a passion for mediation, but not everyone does. Uh, and so having a respect for the process of mediation uh, is important. The lack of it will uh, affect a lawyer's decision as to whether they choose to advise their clients to go to mediation. And it depends on the reasons for going to mediation and when. And you'll remember, I said there's only one reason to settle the case. But if you put five lawyers in a room and ask them what's a, a give me the reasons for going to mediation you, you might find 10 answers yeah. and finally it depends on the client and when i've been giving this talk face to face um i, I always pause it on this slide and i ask the audience what's wrong with uh what's wrong with this slide there's something wrong with it can you tell me what's wrong with it uh, and sometimes people come up with the answer I, I'm looking for. And the answer I'm looking for, hopefully you can see my cursor, is this line. It depends on the client. It's at the bottom of the slide. And that seems normal to many, uh, many people, certainly many practitioners. But it's very easy to forget. Uh, and as a lawyer, I, I hold a mirror up to myself and I can say, I, I'm sure I, I know, not I'm sure, I know I forgot it um many times um the client's the most important person it's the client's dispute not the lawyer's dispute and it should be the client's decision as to whether matters go to to mediation or not um, so that always comes with a certain smile especially for from from lawyers who, who realize that they think they um it, it often think it's their case so I have this slide, our lawyer is the friend or enemy of mediation. And you'll see it's in, it's in speech marks. Uh, and I was lucky enough to um, give a talk at the Singapore Mediation Center uh, uh, two or three years ago. And uh, I think the talk then was something around the lines of, is mediation, or, is mediation still an alternative dispute resolution process? And I had within that talk some slides about the relationship of lawyers. And having read it, um, the, those who were putting on the talk uh, asked me if I would change the, the talk to um, have a title, Are Lawyers the Enemy of Mediation? Uh, and I graciously declined to do that, not least because I had some lawyer clients who were coming in. But it got me, it, it got me thinking, uh, and it certainly it was a similar slide to this. Yeah. And I think it's important to, to think about the lawyer's role in mediation because they have an absolutely crucial role. They've been involved in the case for a, a lot longer than the mediator has. And for me, many mediators forget that. Right? Um, and so they have a, a role to play, but it's important to recognize that there are positives and there are negatives. The positives are uh, obvious it's that experience it, of the the dispute itself it's an understanding of the legal and arbitral process so there's someone who is guiding the client who knows what's going to happen who we able to who who should be able to assess um and know what what's coming down down the road well um independent and dispassionate you'll see there's a question mark some lawyers are not all of them, but they can be. Uh, again, a question mark against the next line, doing what's right for the client. Um, again, I like to think most lawyers will do, um, that they'll put the client's interest. But again, it's a question mark. There'll be people who would disagree um, with that and give examples of disagree. But what we certainly have, and it's the same in, in, in most jurisdictions, uh, um, there are professional obligations and there are, are duties on the part of lawyers. And that's really important because it keeps things in check. Um, 
Uh, and it's certainly an advantage as a mediator making use of lawyers in the mediation. But there are negatives. And it comes back to the earliest slides. A lawyer works in a determinative mode and not a resolution mode. And that is not a criticism. A, a lawyer has to, when you are doing the, the, whether it's the letters before action, the pleadings, the witness statements, the helping out, uh, assuring expert reports are, are undertaken, the disclosure, the discovery. Everything is being done on the basis that you are preparing a, a presentation, be it a, a trial, whatever. You are preparing it for someone else to make a decision. And therefore, everything you do has to be in this determination mode. It has to be geared towards saying, this is our case. This is right. The other side is wrong. Now, please determine in our favor. And that's not resolution mode. Now. And the concentration it is always on wants and needs. My client's case is for a million dollars. He wants a million dollars. You don't start a trial and tell a judge, um, your honor, my lord, my client's case is for a million, but um, you can just award him half a million. That doesn't happen. It's all on, on wants, not needs. And evidence gathering is with an aim to prove your case, your client's case, and disprove your opponent's case. Yeah. And then there's the other thing, stepping aside, and it comes back. Uh, and I apologize if I sound like a scratch record sometimes, but it's this confusion over well, what's the purpose of mediation? And if your purpose of mediation is, as I, I, I attended a talk fairly recently and, and someone was telling, was say a professional, was saying that they attend mediations most times simply to flex the mu their muscles to, to show just how hard a battle the other side is going to be, or they go to hear what the other side has to say as a fishing expedition. Well, that, that's why it comes, in my view, in a negative, not a positive. Um, uh, and that's you know, that. That's a a fairly a, a fairly common thing. So, what's the effects of this in in practice? Um, and I, I what I find, uh, and this is all about understanding it, because if you understand it, you can deal with it. So, I find that there are many examples where lawyers involved in litigation will, in, so I apologise, in mitigation in mediation will treated as if they're in litigation or arbitration, sometimes with the same formality, um, but as I put there, with no procedural um, framework. And this, what you then get is adversarial posturing, no different to what you'd get if they were standing up in front of, of a judge. You get concentration on the legal positions, on the factual arguments, and they're often the lawyer's own argument. The lawyer wasn't there when these facts happened, but lawyers are very good at telling you what actually did, did happen. And why that's important, why it's important to understand this, that this, this is something that, that is there and can happen, because you can deal with it as a mediator. And so one of the things that, as my practice has developed over the years is, um, in the UK, we do a very much a mix of, of um, joint sessions and private sessions, with, with most of the mediation actually being in private session. And traditional mediation starts with um, an opening session. Uh, and I personally, and I'm certainly not alone, there are many mediators who follow this, I no longer have an opening session. Uh, I've remained a big fan of a joint session, but it's never going to be an opening session. So I work with the parties in private for quite a while and sometimes quite a few hours going from room, room to room. And why do I do this? Because I know if I start the day with an opening session, I'm going to get lawyers acting as if they're in litigation. And if I work with them and being aware of that, if I work with them for a period of time to find out what exactly are the, the needs rather than the wants, I can then structure a joint session 
to be much more useful and beneficial to the process to and towards the goal of getting a settlement. And so that's that's what it comes down to understanding why it's important to understand what can happen. Because if you don't, you find lawyers, lawyers have an inability. They've been telling their clients if they if they believe it. And what I see in mediation is both sides genuinely believe their case. It's why cases fight. It's why cases in, in at first instance court of appeal and even in the Supreme Court fight with lawyers not pretending they believe in their case or clients pretending they believe in their case but actually believing in it and that presents a difficulty trying to make or being able to make concessions um, to acknowledge weaknesses and to actually speak about the merits of the other side's case um, and that's that's what can can happen in terms of mediation and what you have if you're not aware of this and you don't deal with it as a mediator you have when you get together in a, a joint session good faith arguments which effectively means one party saying we're good they're bad we're right they're they're wrong yeah. and what i said about the, if you remember the last slide the last point about the fishing expeditions and trying to spin spin the mediator so the fishing expedition is trying to see what this case is is what the other side is really going to say spinning the mediator um uh, certainly happened when i was starting off as a, a mediator where all a party wanted you to do was to be their mouth their their mouthpiece um uh, and um I, I remember one of my very first mediations and it was a lawyer who had instructed me several times uh as a uh, uh as an advocate um and when I went into their room for a private session, he says to me, it's great to have you as a mediator. We instructed, we retained you as a mediator because we want you to go into the other side and tell them they're wrong and they're going to lose. Um, and they were incredibly surprised where, when I said uh, to the individual who I'd known for years, that's not how this is going to work. So that that's what happened. That That's the sort of effect. And... Um, what does this lead to if you have this legal posturing? Uh, and I, I've summed it up, taking the, the name from the famous Western field, the good, the bad and the ugly, that um, lawyers come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, and I think the vast majority come within the, the first two, the good and the bad. But really, it's the not so bad. You get some lawyers who really who, who believe in the process or believe that this particular dispute should or must settle at mediation and they support the process they're happy with settlement they're keen to assist and that that you know it, it it's it's a breath of, of of fresh air um and it's a lot of lawyers it, you know, this isn't a, a minority and then the bad and that is unfair because it's not bad it's and i think it's the majority support the process but they will fight their corner and you will get phrases like settlement, but not at any price. Um, I won't, and they won't make it easy for the mediator or or the other side. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you do get sometimes in mediation those who are there, uh, effectively to make sure the process does not succeed. Um, and I have had experience, and it, it's limited, but I have had it in a few mediations where it's quite clear that. A lawyer, uh, and I've had two mediations, I think, where they made it clear, they even told me that they had no intention of allowing their client to settle. Uh, uh, and that sometimes is a disruptive element um, in the mediation. So that's um, that's sort of a, a background to it. Uh, and um, I, I can talk on, on lots of things uh, um, in terms of the relationship and, and hot topics. But given the... the um, uh, timing. Uh, I know people want to maybe ask a few questions. I've concentrated uh, on a, a few topics that I think are really key at the moment, certainly in the UK. And, and um, I, I mediated recently in, in the US and very much the same, um, the same there. Um, and the first one is the timing of the mediation. And this is important because given that everything I am seeing or the vast majority of what I'm seeing is within the litigation or arbitration process, the timing of the mediation is, the, is a, a key um, issue. Um, 
And the question is how, um, how early on in, in the process? And so the two statements there that are in the light or in the blue um, are said often. Uh, and I'll say, well, you can't possibly have a mediation until there's sufficient information on liability and quantum, uh, until we can take a decision on, on risk. Yeah? Uh, and you will have some lawyers who will tell you impossible to have a mediation until we've, until we've had disclosure, discovery, or until we've exchanged witness statements and even expert reports. Uh, and that's a really... Uh, certainly in the UK, that can be a long way down the road and tens of thousands, I mean, the, the, the sort of cases I see, hundreds of thousands of pounds or dollars worth of costs having been expended. And so going back to the first, it's that one of the key things is assessing risk. And that's, that's a really um, interesting question as to how can, how can you assess risk and when can you assess risk? Can you only assess risk when you have witness statements from both sides saying different things? When you have expert reports, if it's an expert report case, where you have two highly competent, highly specialized, perhaps highly respected experts saying completely contradictory things. Are you at a position there that it's easier to assess risk? And so the question I pose, uh, and I pose whenever I'm uh, uh, giving a talk to, especially to, to lawyers, um, is, well, how about the sooner the better? It's not complicated. How about getting to mediation and talking about the dispute sooner rather than later? And what I'm often uh, I, in talks, especially where it's face to face, and people I've had said to me, are you seriously saying that it's never too soon to get to, to mediation? And my answer to that is that it, there will be cases, uh, there will be disputes where it is possibly too soon for the parties to be willing to reach a settlement. But mediation, the goal of mediation is, to, is aiming to get a settlement. It's not getting a settlement, it's aiming. It's a process, a road towards settlement. And if you're lucky, you may get it in one day, but many mediations, that process carries on after the mediation day going forward. So that leads to the answer that yes, it may be too early, to have a one day mediation and get a settlement. But in my view, it is never too early for parties in a dispute to be talking about the dispute and why they are in dispute. And that's why, and you may have heard of this, this phrase, it's being used um, by different people of early stage mediation. And what early stage or ESM, um, I, I put there, what is it, how early, what format? And, and the answer is, it's no different format. The only thing that's not a separate format, the only thing that changes is that you get a dispute, the client's dispute, not the lawyer's dispute. You get the clients, um, clients to talk about it earlier. And when you talk about a dispute earlier, you actually are talking about the dispute rather than the legal case or the arbitral case. And there's a huge distinction because once you go down that road, and if you've been traveling down that road for several years, you are only talking about the litigation or the arbitration. And parties sometimes even forget the reason why they were, why they were in, in dispute. And so why would you go there at an early stage? It's because of that. It's because you have clients where it's fresh in their mind. They, um, they will find it easier to be able to have a discussion, certainly in commercial cases, about the matters that are in dispute. And it will be easier, not always, but on many occasions, to find options for settlement 
that may be monetary, monetary, but may not be. There may be other things as well. And also, of course, I mean, I, I do a lot of construction mediations and, I, and I'm seeing more early mediations in the construction area. You may be able to keep that relationship going. And that's, in, that's crucially important. Downside, of course, there are. You may, it may be um, that it is a waste of time. Some mediations end up there being a waste of time. That may be because of one party or both parties or individuals or, or lawyers or whatever. So there's always, there's always that. But the benefits of having something, of starting this mediation process, this process at getting to a settlement, at aiming for a settlement, starting earlier rather than later, is the key to this. And what does it require to work? For this to be used more often, it requires a change of ethos, in my view. And as I said, these are these are very personal views, but it does require a change of ethos, certainly in the UK, of uh, instead of effectively, if you go to a lawyer and there is a dispute and it can be litigated, the knee-jerk reaction is to think of litigation or arbitration. But it's whether you can have a knee-jerk reaction to think, or a pause, not a knee-jerk reaction, hold on, I'm not going to tell my client, let's go straight to litigation, let's start this process. I'm going to say to my client, why don't we think about mediation? Why don't we give that a go? Before we do anything else, before you spend any more money, it's still going to cost you some money to go down the mediation route, but let, let's go down that route. And the interesting thing, uh, it, it's hard to find good things that have come out of this terrible pandemic. But one of the things that I, I have noticed, and, and uh, I've now done, uh, I think I'm, I'm coming up to about my 50th remote mediation since last March. And the one thing I have seen over the year is that there are, there's been an increased percentage of cases coming earlier. And that's because the court, there's been a problem in, in the courts, et cetera. So it, it's had, had that process. Wow. So let me just talk about some, um, just the other hot topic, because it, it, it's, it's relevant to the relationship um, between the, the process, litigation, arbitration, uh, and um, mediation. And that's potential hurdles that there are. Uh, and I list them, and I think these are all things, whether you're a student, whether you're a mediator, whether you're a lawyer watching, whatever stage you're at, um, these are things to, to think of. The level of, of preparation is key for me. I often see too little preparation having been undertaken. Or put another way, preparation that um, I know the level of preparation is below that that would have been undertaken had they been attending a trial or arbitration. Um, attendees is something always to think about. Um, and I spend a lot of time in pre-mediation day meeting talking, and, and actually now we do everything on Zoom, encouraging those attendees and making sure key attendees are there because that's a real hurdle. A lawyer deciding, well, I don't think X will come, I don't think Y should come, whatever. It's really important who is actually there on the mediation day, and it often makes a difference as to whether you achieve or get close to settlement or, or not. Lawyers, I've said more than enough on it, but that's something to, to bear in mind. You've got to work out what's going on in the room with, with the lawyer. How long has the lawyer been involved? What's the lawyer's view on the case? What's the lawyer and the client relationship like? That is really important. It's more difficult to see in this in this. Um, remote world, online world that we're working at. When you're sitting in a room, it's much easier to glance back and forth and to see the relationship between them. But it, it's something to, to bear in mind. And that every media has to get is to ascertain where's this authority coming from. I, I deal with a lot of cases that are insurer backed, a lot of mediation cases. Uh, one of the issues that regularly comes up is where's the insurer? The insurer isn't attending. Is that because the insurer doesn't want to? Is that because the lawyer has told them don't not necessary to attend? Um, but if there is no insurer there, where's the authority coming from? Or even if there is an insurer there, how much authority do they do they do they have? Yeah. 
But the biggest thing is having started for any mediator, for me, and when I teach mediation, is, is going back to what I started with, is that word settle. You, whatever hurdle you have in front of you, it's getting parties into what I call settlement mode. It's out of determinative mode and it's into, uh, into settlement mode. And what is settlement mode? Well, effectively, it's, it's like you, you've heard the phrase, the art of negotiation. You know? But for me, it's something that a subtle difference. It requires, as this relationship is so entwined between litigation and mediation, it requires not simply saying, come on, let's now get into a negotiating framework. Let's now start the negotiation. But it's actually working with parties to change their ethos from where they come into the room in that determination mode to being in self-determination mode. And it requires that understanding that I started with of the real purpose for mediation. Now, I, I know all these arguments. I've heard those arguments. You, you, you may be right on that. You may be wrong on this. But it's getting the parties to understand when you're hearing what they're saying is you've got to move into a different way of thinking if you're going to get this over the line to a settlement. And that's getting it into this settlement. Mode. And that's encouraged them by getting them to change from where they are to embarking on the negotiation. But that embarking on the negotiation only happens when they understand they've got to move out of this determination um, mode. Yeah. And the thing for me where I think um, many mediations, certainly I saw as a mediation advocate, as counsel, as a lawyer, where I saw things went wrong, is not recognizing that it was not a bilateral negotiation anymore. The lawyers have been, they've been sending letters to each other, they've been speaking on the phones, maybe even the clients have. They haven't, as two, if it's, let's assume it's the two parties, they haven't been able to get a, a settlement. And so it's a facilitated negotiation. The facilitation is by the mediator, however that mediator is, is operating. And the key that in every mediation, not every, but in, in a lot of mediations that I have to get over to the parties is you are not negotiating with me. You don't need to prove your case to me. You're using me as the person who is going to be um, working with you and with the other, other side. And I often use phrases like, when I'm sitting in this room, whatever you say to me, if you say to me, a judge will find this, I I'm, I'm going to test you on it. But you don't have to prove that to me because you can't. Because I'll never accept, because I don't know if a judge will or won't, because I don't have to make that decision. And so you're not negotiating uh, with me. But the key is, is getting everyone in the room to realize this is where we're heading. We're heading to settle your case, your dispute. We're heading to settle your client's case and dispute. That's our goal. Now let's work on it. Now let me come back on some of the things you've said. Let me challenge. Let me reality check. Let me get as close as uh, I, I personally call myself um, an evaluative mediator, but with a small e. I do not evaluate. I will never tell the parties that a judge will or won't find this on this point but if a party tells me that a judge will find for them i will say to them but what if the judge he or she doesn't find on that point and so that's when you've got them into mode that's when you can start your reality checking that's when you can really get to to grips with the parties and that's when it's all about this negotiation this facilitated negotiation in both rooms and at the right time around a, a a, a table. Uh, and how does this all translate to better, uh, better mediation? If you can get this open, I work with the parties an awful lot before the mediation day, and, uh, and I'm not alone. Most good mediators will be doing this. But it means that you encourage people, and I work with people before they put the bundle together, before they put their, their um, uh, position statements together, to focus on the end prize for their client to put documents together that are relevant to be able to get a settlement, yeah? to think about 
parameters, negotiation settlement parameters before the day, not on the day alone. To encourage them, I, I've actually, I, I should have changed it here, but I don't like to call them position statements anymore. I call them mediation statements. Make them non-positional, make them conciliatory, have the right balance. And remember, you're not seeking to prove or disprove a case to a mediator because that's, um, you know, the mediator is, 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 not, is not there. Um, and finding common interests and needs. There is rarely, if ever, a case that does not have common interests and, and needs. Uh, and that's, that's crucial to understand. Sometimes even as a mediator, I will sit there and, I, and we may have been going for hours and I will, I will be sitting there thinking, oh, I, this is never going to settle. I, I can't get them, the, the Americans use the phrase, you know, get them in the ballpark. Uh, and um, at, at a training I had a couple of years ago, it was, it was actually an American mediator who said, sometimes you realize the, the parties are actually, they haven't even gone into the stadium. They're in separate car parks. Um, and sometimes that doesn't change. But when you can, when you find their, their needs, their mutual needs, um, you're a long way going forward. And I think the final thing, where whoever you are, mediator, lawyer, or client, um, is using the mediator and the process. And that's... <laughs> That perhaps sounds obvious, but I think that's that's something that is missed. Um, and it's a mischance often by clients, by lawyers. It's a mischance by mediators who, who don't take this on board and don't encourage it. But it requires something that runs through everything that certainly um, I do as a mediator, and that is trust. I cannot get the parties to a settlement unless they trust me. And when I teach mediation, that is, it's something that I emphasize the importance of um, building. I've talked about the relationship between mediation and litigation. This is the building the relationship between the mediator and everyone else involved in the mediation process. If they don't trust you, they won't work with you and they won't move their position, their perceptions. And so it's so fundamental. Trust runs through the whole, the whole mediator process. For me, it is absolutely fundamental. And if you have that trust, then parties and lawyers will work with the mediator, uh, and they'll work in the interest of their clients to bring a dispute to an end. And they will, as the previous slide said, they will allow the mediator to be part, if not the integral part, of, of putting this in place, of putting those last pieces of the, the jigsaw together. And so for me, what I see it as is allowing a mediator to use his or her toolbox. And uh, hopefully you will take away a few things from, from this talk. But if not, then I'm going to ask you to take one thing away about whether you are a student, whether you're training to be a mediator, with, uh, wherever you are, um, is how you think about a mediator. And I encourage you to think of the mediator as being the Swiss army knife and recognizing that there are several tools available. And one of the things when I'm, um, when I'm training, I'll be talking about the different ways you can mediate, the different options you have at different stages of negotiation. But when I'm talking to lawyers, I, and I will put this slide up, I'll say, remember a mediator has been in both rooms. They know what's going on. So when a mediator makes a suggestion to you, I'm gonna go into the other room and I'm gonna use the scissors. Don't try and talk the mediator out and say, no, why don't you use the corkscrew? It's relying on the mediator. That depends on the trust, but it, it's relying on them. Um, so that, go away, think about your, your mediator. Think about the mediator you want to be as being a, a Swiss Army knife. Uh, I'm gonna have to tell you that not all mediators are the same. So that's my Swiss Army knife, um, I hope. It's much easier putting that up when there's a live audience and, and there's a reaction to it. So I've now been speaking for, um, I think, the best part of an hour. Um, and I always like to finish my talks on someone else's uh, words. And so to sum it all up, 
um, it was actually President Ronald Reagan who said, I always believed that a lot of the troubles in the world would disappear if we were talking to each other instead of about each other. Uh, and I could not agree more with those words. Thank you very much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, presenting and hopefully we have time for a, a few questions. Thank you, Andrew, for that really informative talk. Um, we do have a few questions before you go. So our first question is about your experience mediating in different countries. Um, we'd like to know how your experience has varied in different countries, so in Europe and also further afield. Uh, it, it, it's a great question. Um, I worked for 15, uh, over 15 years of, of my work life. Um, I, uh, I was getting on and off of planes and doing a lot of international arbitration. Uh, and I had to have, I did, I, I, I've worked in, in, most of my work in terms of international arbitration was in Southeast Asia, but I worked in, in Germany, in France, in, in the US. And I, when my first overseas trip as, as a lawyer was, I was only five years qualified. And it was a steep learning curve. And what was the learning curve was the, the cultural learning curve. Uh, and um, you have to be aware of the cultural differences. And I think what, um, what has come out as a mediator is the, is having to be, because you're orchestrating, a, a, you're, in a sense, you're the conductor of an orchestra when you're mediating, it's being even more well aware of the, the cultural differences. Um, and all the things I said is, is I, you know, I've made a point to find out like I talk about respect for the process. Well, how much is the process used? How much is it is it is it respected? Um, but even in the mediation room, it's the subtleties of it. So it's understanding that there may be a reason why in the UK uh, I can very um, if there's a mediation, I I can say to a lawyer, you should get the decision maker here at, there at the mediation day. But I know in certain cultures, the decision maker will never come to the mediation. And I've learned that. And I, it would be, I derail the process if I said, get that person here. I have to be aware that the person in front of me at the mediation, and, and this has happened, I know full well, they can't actually make the decision. And it's working with them. And it's this subtlety, almost of pretending that you think they can make the decision when you know that every half hour when they're saying they need a toilet break, they don't actually need a toilet break, they're going out to make a phone call. Uh, and it's just recognizing those subtleties. The other one is, and, and on a much more um, uh, a basic and perhaps even more humorous level, um, in the UK, um, food is generally not important. In some cultures, most, in fact, we're, we're the exception. Food is incredibly important. And if you if you just keep a process going, um, so I, I worked a lot in the Philippines. The Philippines, they joke, but it's true. They have seven meals a day. And if you interrupt their, their, their meals, um, that's a terrible thing. So you have to be, you have to be really aligned to the, these, these cultural points uh, and, and have the, these breaks. For me personally, it's what makes it so interesting. It's understanding how, how everything works. But you can't go in. Um, you know, I, I, I'm very, very conscious that, you know, and I hope I don't in the UK go in as a stuck up lawyer. But I know in many parts of the world, if I go in as a pompous UK barrister, that's not going to go, that's not going to go down well. And it comes down to, I've said, I realise I can't do it without getting the trust of the parties. And the only way I get the trust is being respectful to them. Um, and so you have to learn um, you know, how, how to be respectful and what you need to do in order to, one, be respectful and to get that respect back and that trust. 
Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, and how you spoke about how different countries have different approaches towards mediation. Um, someone has asked, how might the use of mediation be encouraged in countries where it's not currently favoured? Well, it, it's a long road. So I know there's lots of people from India attending. You know, uh, I have worked with Indian lawyers for, for several years. Uh, and in the last few years, uh, I've been doing a lot in terms of um, mediation in, in India. And India is, is a great example where um, the universities, the law schools are not just encouraging mediation, but teaching it to an incredibly high level, um, far more than in, in the UK. Uh, and the um, mediation competitions, I, I, I was um, giving a talk for one yesterday, uh, the, the opening uh, of one yesterday. Um, the mediation competitions, last year I was there judging one in Lucknow uh, at the Dr. Ram um, University. And I was blown over by the, by the enthusiasm of obviously the participants, but the staff at the university, um, about 60, I think, lawyers who'd flown in from the four corners of India to judge it and judiciary. And I got on that talk, I was really uh, absolutely privileged and um, it ended up with me speaking at the Supreme Court in, in Delhi. Now, this isn't me blowing my trumpet. There's a reason for this. When you go to India, Everyone is talking about mediation at every level in terms of law. That is, so that's the law schools, the lawyers, the judges, but it's not being used to a great extent. And so the question is a huge question, having, having we just bounced back your question to you, uh, why? And why is it? Because ultimately, mediation will have to, be, have to be as it is in the UK. It's been going in the UK for 30 years, part of the litigation process. And who are the gatekeepers to mediation in, in, let's talk about our jurisdiction in the UK, who are the gatekeepers, the lawyers? And who has to ultimately be the gatekeepers in, I'm taking India as, as, as a big example because I think the, the prospects for mediation is so good in India. The lawyers themselves are gonna have to be the gatekeepers. That's the only way. And so to answer how, it's going to have to be, and I think that I've now been working with, with in India for the last three years, it, I, I, there's going to be at some stage enough lawyers who are going to say, you know what, I'm going to start advising my, my clients to, to use it. Uh, I'm going to push it forward. And you know, the numbers are so huge, a population of you know, 1.3 to 1.4 billion. It's not going to take very much in terms of a domino effect when some start using it. To get it to get it growing, Singapore is a great example. It, what? How did they? The mediation has taken off there, and Hong Kong as well. They made use of, of the international mediators at first, uh, and Singapore now still does, but it has its own fantastic mediators by you know in huge numbers, uh, and Hong Kong the same. And so I think it, India has to I embrace the. Uh, it is embracing the international mediation fraternity who are willing to help, but that's how it's going to start. It's going to be start making use of it and and that. And the same, in, I mean, I, I've done a lot of work in, in the Emirates and, right, and they talk about the, the need, the, this need for mediation, which is not unfamiliar because mediation has effectively gone back a thousand plus years in the Emirates. It was the village elder and it actually is still used a lot in Emirati to Emirati, business to business. Um, and they talk about there is, is it, it's going to be when, when certain people start using it, it's gonna be a bit like the, you know, the Louis Vuitton Gucci handbag, oh, I want that as well. And it will be that effect of, of people of copying. So I, I know, I think these are really exciting times um, of many, many areas of the world. Um, sort of coming around to the, the view um, that this process, this process really has a place and possibly has its own place um, to play. 
Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think this is about all we have time for today, and it's probably good to end on that uplifting note as well. So I'd like to thank you for coming along today and providing your really insightful, well thought out presentation. I think it was going to help a lot of our students in the audience. And I'd like to thank all our students who we have here too for coming along. It's good to see so many of you here, some familiar faces or names at least. Um, please, could everyone remember to fill out the feedback form so that you can receive your e-certificates? And um, yeah, um, I'd like to wish everyone a really good rest of your day. And you too, Andrew. Thank you so much. It's thank been you, Phoebe, uh, And thank you to Garima and to the whole of the team. Um, it's a fantastic thing you're doing. And it, let me just go back for one second to that question of what the what's the future you are all the future oh <laughs> and that's the, that's the incredible thing that your generation really is the the future i did my first mediation in 1995 there's a lot of people no doubt um watching this that weren't alive then um and it was explained to me by an american in-house counsel who said, we're going to take this case to mediation. I genuinely, I was five years qualified. I didn't know if he was talking about medication or meditation. Um, <laughs> I did not know what mediation was um, yeah, to any proper degree. I did not know anything about the process. Um, and yeah, I learned very, very quickly. And from that stage, I, I very quickly became a fan, but that's the difference. You, 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 all of you, I was about to say you lot, but that sounds insulting, but all of you, the younger generation coming up, studying law, um, going into the profession, are going to, to be the future. And I, I think hopefully are going to understand that it is as, you know, litigation will always be there. It's one of the oldest professions, but mediation can stand on its own, own, own two feet. Um, and I'll finish with one line that I actually say in my, my mediation to encourage the lawyers it is that the greatest gift that any lawyer can give their client is the gift of settlement. So go forward, be qualified and go give the gift of settlement in all your disputes. Uh, and thank you very much, everyone. I, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you so much, Andrew. Have a lovely rest of your day. It's thank been you. Really good. Thank you, everyone, on, on the Mediate Guru team. Thank you.